This lesson continues a study of the book of Exodus from Moses' first confrontation with Pharaoh to the ninth of ten plagues. And we see uh, chapter 5 there. As mentioned in the previous lesson, the three-day journey that Moses tells Pharaoh to grant Israel is, to worship God is a diplomatic expression, meaning basically we intend to leave and never come back. Verse 8 is where Pharaoh decides that the only reason this request is made is because the slaves have too much free time to spend it listening to troublemakers like Moses. So in his infinite wisdom, he turns the screws tighter by making them go out and scavenge for straw, the straw that they need to make bricks. Now, if we go down to verse 10, quotas are not being met, so the Hebrew foremen are being beaten. As the saying goes, the beatings will continue until morale improves. So then we know how that, well, well, that usually works, but if we go down here a little bit farther to verse 15, the foremen are going to Pharaoh to ask why they're being beaten for this unreasonable demand, and they leave the court without any relief at all. Pharaoh just, you know, just isn't going to listen at all. So on their way out, they meet Moses and Aaron. What bad timing. So the foremen vent their anger on them and blame them for their suffering. Who can blame them at that point? But that's what they do. They're, they're thinking, you know, ever since Moses and Aaron got there, things have only gotten worse. In turn, if we look down here at verse 22, Moses whines to God that not only has Pharaoh not let the people go, he has made them shoot the messenger, essentially, who didn't want to do this in the first place. We remember him telling God, pick somebody else. Well, now it seems like maybe for now it seems like he was right. But not in the long run, of course. And so now in chapter 6, God repeats his assurance and the promise he made to Abraham and Isaac and then commands Moses to pass this on to the people of Israel. But of course, if we go down here to verse 9, the Israelites aren't in any mood to listen. Even so, God tells Moses to try a second time with Pharaoh and Moses repeats his claim of being a poor speaker in spite of such a statement making God angry at him the first time he said it. But he tries it again anyway. There seems to be a pattern here between Moses and Israel. And then down in verse 14, at this point, the, next, the text stops to do a genealogy of the sons of Levi. And we might wonder why here and now and why Levi? But Constable's notes, as, the, as usual, the link is in the description, argues that it's to establish the pedigree of Moses and Aaron since Israel isn't listening to them anymore. There's also a handy genealogical chart in those notes, so you might want to check that out. So now to chapter 7, we'll skip down to that, past the genealogy. And this chapter begins with a curious statement from God, that he has made Moses like God to Pharaoh, and Aaron like Moses' prophet. But the pharaohs by this time had come to be regarded as literal gods who would simply pass from one mortal body to the next as each one wore out and died. And they would usually pass it, almost always pass it on to their son. So God is both putting Pharaoh in his place and giving confidence to Moses. But he adds that he himself will harden Pharaoh's heart. So Moses should expect more resistance rather than any progress at this time. And then they just add on in the text here that uh, Moses is 80 years old by this time, and Aaron is 83. And if you recall the chart that was done before about the timelines, that's where this comes from. So, the question is, what does it mean that God hardens Pharaoh's heart? Does God override a person's free will? We've already seen the freely chosen condition of this Pharaoh's heart, being arrogant and disrespectful of any other claims to div divine authority over him. And he has shown his character in no uncertain terms. So what God is doing is only increasing the degree, not the condition or bent, of Pharaoh's heart. Many Christians tend to read post-cross salvation requirements into pre-cross times and then misapply that error onto the age of grace again and conclude that God chooses who to save and who to condemn. But God has not chosen to condemn Pharaoh without having him having a chance to choose or live. He'd lived quite a while up to that point, 
and he'd had plenty of chances before God actually starts hardening his heart. So God is merely choosing, closing the door, as is the case when anyone dies. The opportunity to choose sides is gone at that point. So what's the difference between a person's life ending when God says it will end and their choices have been closed up, or closing it before they die and then using them after that point for some purpose? That's the only difference. So Pharaoh's heart being hardened is no more of an argument against free will than anyone just dying before they decide to be saved. It's, this, it's really just no different in principle. So now let's go down here to verse 8. And they appear before Pharaoh as they had before. This time he demands a miraculous, miraculous sign just as God said he would. So Aaron throws down his staff and it turns into a snake. Though the Greek text in this chapter uses the word dragon, whereas it used serpent back in chapter 4. But the Egyptian sorcerers are able to turn their staffs into, and it uses the word dragons here as well, but even though Aaron's staff then swallows up all the sorcerer's staff. And Pharaoh is not impressed. Symbolically, the consuming of Egyptian staffs meant that God had sovereignty over Pharaoh, but he rejected the claim. So in other words, by this sign, it really isn't a plague. God is saying, I'm God and you're not, but Pharaoh just couldn't care less. So let's go down to verse 14, and this is where the actual plagues begin. Since Pharaoh basically yawned at the miraculous sign of the staff becoming a snake, God is upping the ante. Moses will intercept Pharaoh at the Nile, since not, uh, Pharaoh would go down there every morning for religious reasons, and he would turn the Nile to blood, including water that was already taken from there and stored in containers, anything that came directly from the Nile. This would kill all the fish and make a stench, and no one would be able to use Nile water, which of course was central to their lives, not only for drinking and, and irrigation and so forth, but also for religious purposes. Now, Constable notes that various natural plagues, such as of frogs or bugs, hail, darkness even, were common seasonal problems, but God is going to directly control their timing and their intensity, and in some cases, their selectiveness in afflicting only the Egyptians. The notes also state that these plagues will all take place in northern Egypt near Zoan, per Psalm 7843, and that of course, is either the same as or near Goshen, where the Israelites lived. So God has prepared Moses before, and now he's preparing Pharaoh. And then we'll go down here to verse 20. And so Moses and Aaron do what God commanded, and the result is as God told him it would be. But again, the Egyptian soothsayers do the same. So again, Pharaoh yawns and goes home. It would have been much more impressive if the soothsayers could undo what Moses did instead of only copying it and making things worse for their own people. And this condition, condition lasts for seven days, which if it were merely the seasonal redness of the water from flooding, it would have lasted about three months and the water would still have been drinkable and not deadly to the fish. So it is a miracle regardless of any natural cause was involved at all, this one had significant differences from the seasonal problem. So now let's go down to chapter 8, to the second plague, and that is that the Nile will swarm with frogs, and they'll come out onto the land and enter all the houses. As one of the many sacred animals, a person could be put to death even for killing one accidentally, so having them underfoot would be a huge problem for the Egyptians. And then we'll go down here to verse 8. Only after this happens does Pharaoh ask Moses and Aaron to end the plague. And again, we note that he doesn't ask his sorcerers to do so, obviously because they're unable. But God, through Moses, lets Pharaoh decide the moment the plague is to end. So there's another unnatural thing. But when it does, and they've piled up the frogs and the land just reeks with the smell... You would think this would have put a dent in the people's reverence for them as sacred animals, but like any of us, as soon as God answers the prayer and everything's cleaned up, Pharaoh retracts his promise to let Israel go. So let's go down here to verse 16. 
The third plague is of gnats, though it could also mean lice or fleas or even mosquitoes, according to who you, you know what research or commentator you read. But this time the soothsayers can't duplicate the plague, and they recognize a divine power, at least, more powerful than their dark arts. Pharaoh just shrugs it off, even though his own magicians were outmatched and have just basically admitted to using tricks instead of actually having power. And then down in verse 20, we see the fourth plague that is something called dog flies, but just to make sure the Egyptians don't think Moses is working for any run-of-the-mill deity, God only sends it on the Egyptians and not the land where the Israelites live. And this time, God does it without requiring any action on the part of Moses or Aaron. Constable notes that these flies preferred to latch onto people's eyelids and could actually cause disfigurement because of the swelling because these flies would bite and sting. And not even Pharaoh's house is spared, but if we can see down here in verse 25, even though he finally agrees to let Israel worship God, he wants them to do so in Egypt. But, you know, so at least they get a day off. He thinks he's being nice by doing that. But since such worship would involve animal sacrifice, the Egyptians would kill them, so they have to leave Egypt entirely. And God will not compromise or strike a deal, and Moses warns Pharaoh not to lie again. But Pharaoh, he'll relent, but once again, as soon as Moses prays for God to end the plague, Pharaoh breaks his word. Now the fifth plague starts in chapter 9, and it's of a terrible disease on the cattle and horses and oxen and sheep. In other words, their work and farm animals. And again, the land of Goshen is spared. This time, Pharaoh makes no offers or promises, but just digs in his heels and refuses to let Israel go. And then in verse 8, the sixth plague is of terrible boils that break out on the skin of all the Egyptians and their animals after Moses throws handfuls of soot into the air as Pharaoh watches. He still couldn't care less, and this is the first time we're told that God actually causes his obstinance. This is the first time where God says, I did this, I hardened his heart. And it took six plagues. You know, the first five were Pharaoh's own problem. And then down verse 13, if all that wasn't enough, the seventh plague will prove once and for all that Egypt has no God like the God of Israel. God explains to Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron that the only reason Egypt hasn't been totally and instantly wiped out is because God is using all this to prove his point. But this time he gives a warning to whoever among the Egyptians chooses to listen to put your people and animals under strong shelter because a hailstorm is coming, the likes of which will never have been seen in Egypt before. Some of Pharaoh's attendants actually listen, but others don't. So even in this, God is showing mercy to Egyptians on an individual basis. So he's letting them choose because they're having to do what Pharaoh says, and even they are given a chance individually to listen to God and spare themselves some of the suffering. Now let's go down to verse 22 where we see that the plague turned out to be not only the hail itself, but also very loud thunder and a fire that, as the Greek text puts it, ran about on the land. Lightning is referred to as fire in verse 24, so we could speculate that this might have been something like ball lightning, though some commentators think it means that lightning would just strike the ground and cause fires which spread on the land. Regardless, none of this affected the land of Goshen, and that's the point. But it's just an interesting statement about fire running along the ground. So now down to verse 27. God finally has Pharaoh's attention, and Pharaoh confesses the, his own sins and the sins of his people. But Moses, of course, knows better than to think Pharaoh's being honest at this time, even though all their crops were ruined, except what they say, the later harvests and that hadn't um, come up yet. And many people and animals had died, and as expected, when the plague stops, so does Pharaoh's shallow guilt trip, an even shallower promise. So now we go down to verse 10, I'm sorry, chapter 10, and God is about to unleash the eighth plague, and he tells Moses that with it he will make fools of Pharaoh and his court. This time it's locusts who will cover the land and strip it of whatever the hail plague didn't pulverize. And as soon as Moses leaves Pharaoh's court, his advisors ask him if he's even aware that Egypt is already in ruins. 
But Pharaoh's retort is that Israel will indeed need their God's help if he lets more than just the Hebrew men leave the country, that that's what he was offering. Well, just the men can go. In other words, he'd rather see everybody die than to give in. So if we go down to verse 12, we'll see that God sends the plague, and again Pharaoh pretends to really mean it this time, and Moses prays for relief anyway, but God hardens his heart again, and the stalemate continues, even if it means the ruin of Egypt. He just couldn't care less. So then we come to the ninth plague, down in verse 21, and it is a palpable, gloomy darkness. And it again, it comes only on the Egyptians, even without Moses saying anything to Pharaoh. It lasts for three full days, which some say also refers to a future prophetic event, but no such thing is prophesied except over the kingdom of the beast during the tribulation, and it doesn't say the number of days. So some people say we're looking for, you know, the three days of darkness. I don't know why. Just because a lot of the plagues of Revelation have similarities to the plagues of Egypt doesn't mean they will be repeated, doesn't mean they won't. But nowhere in Daniel or Revelation do we see anything but darkness coming on the kingdom of the beast only, and not for any specified number of days. But it is the similar kind of darkness that is something that is almost felt and terrifying. So much for that. That's really kind of a, a little side issue. But um, the thing is that when Pharaoh summons Moses and tells him everyone can go, but they have to leave the livestock, so he's letting out a little bit more saying, okay, the women and children can go, but you got to leave all your stuff here. Moses refuses to compromise, and Pharaoh just throws him out of his court permanently and says, you won't see me again. And Moses that says, that's right, you won't see me again. Now, in the next chapters, we will find out that there was a little more of ex an exchange, but right now, that's all it tells us. And we'll probably just pick up that in the next lesson, when we start uh, looking at the tenth and final plague. And then, of course, after that, the exit of Israel from Egypt that finally happens, but it took ten plagues. And again, the point of this lesson is that these plagues had a purpose, and even though at first Moses was being made to look bad by it, and I'm sure we can all draw lessons from that because we do the same thing. We do something we're for sure that God wants us to do and then things get worse. And the important thing is, is that God is always shaping us and we have to trust him anyway and make sure that we're hearing him properly and that we're not just saying, I heard a voice in my head and I'm sure it was God because too many people do that, especially I mentioned about the three days of darkness belief in something happening in prophecy, but a lot of people, sincere people, don't seem to know the difference between a vivid imagination and God actually speaking. You would think if you watched prophecy websites and, and video channels that some people go to heaven every other day and get a tour and get to sit on God's lap and talk to him or that Jesus appears to them every night in dreams and tells them specific details of what's going to happen next. And I'm having a hard time believing that. I mean, these sort of things are recorded in the Bible because they are rare. Miracles, by definition, are unusual. And yes, the Bible does say that, that people will have visions and dream dreams, but not every five minutes, and not everybody, regardless of their walk, and not everybody who just says, I heard a voice or a thought popped in my head and it must be God. That's not how this works. These things that we're reading about are recorded because they're miraculous and unusual and God does them at a certain time as he has the habit of doing, as we'd see throughout the Bible, of doing things like this, like these plagues, for example, to illustrate a change, if nothing else, to say God is doing something outstanding. There's about to be a significant change in life for at least some people, and it is marked by miracles and signs. This happened in the first century as well, when on, on the day of Pentecost, 
um, when people were suddenly able to talk in languages they didn't know and um, later on with the apostles that those were the marks of an apostle one of the things was being able to do these miracles that's not the norm is the point so when you read about this three days of darkness for example like anything else you would read as you're going along be careful not to misapply it or use it as an excuse to go off the rails and forget about what the purpose is of these things when God does give dreams and visions and and talks to people directly he didn't talk to just anybody on every day and even the people he did talk to um, they didn't get talked to all the time and you were there was a lot of times that we've studied in these lessons so far when we would think God would explain something but God doesn't have to and he talks at certain times to certain people for certain reasons and no matter what times we're living in when it comes to prophecy um, we have to remember that we can't just take every idea that pops in our head or follow any Pied Piper that says I've got the calculations I know exactly when such and such is going to happen that's not how this works and that's one of the overarching lessons we can get out of anything we're studying but we have to know what the immediate context is and this immediate context is of God freeing his people and keeping his promises and these are all things that were predicted and we're being given these things in a language not of fiction but of chronicling history and tying it to real events that can be checked that's one of the unique things about the Bible is fulfilled prophecy and its historical accuracy because the Bible is giving names now it doesn't say exactly for example which exact Pharaoh the name of the Pharaoh although you can look at constables notes and find out more about that but the point is and, and you have to be careful also with secular Egyptology there's a bunch of bias and errors in that too but the point is that whenever the Bible is account you know giving an account of something that happened it doesn't try to couch it in cryptic language so you can't track it down that's the point it, the Bible gives names and dates and ages and ties them to events in history so at any rate we will continue on as as I said with the final plague and then exactly what happens as they leave Egypt next time